Yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, first uh, webinar series uh, being organized by the Meyer College of Education. Uh, this has mainly been done uh, to try and share some information about new developments in the field of education, especially during this uh, lockdown period, uh, which we all know is a testing time for all of us, especially educators who are trying to you know, gain strength and try out teaching through ICT uh, in this uh, times. Uh, but I'm uh, extremely pleased uh, to welcome uh, Professor Chris Brown from the University of Durham in UK. Uh, who has agreed to participate in this first webinar uh, and he would be uh, talking to us about mobilizing knowledge for teacher professional development, the importance of networks, leadership and uh, distributed leadership. Uh, before I ask Chris to uh, start the proceeding, I would just like to you know, introduce uh, Professor Chris Brown to all of you. Uh, as we know that he is the professor of education and the director of research uh, currently at the School of Education in Durham University. And uh, previous to that, he has been engaged in different uh, capacities at the University of uh, Portsmouth. He was a senior lecturer at the University College London. He was also an associate researcher at the University of Sussex and a senior policy advisor at the UK Ministry of Justice. Uh, besides that, his uh, area of research has been uh, professional learning uh, network uh, as a means of uh, to promote the collaboration and collaborative learning of teachers. Uh, he's uh, widely published and uh, uh, finds his name in topmost journals uh, in education. He has uh, penned down a number of books, uh, which I'm sure uh, all of you, when you go online, you will be able to see, but we'll be able to share some of his work with you uh, later. Uh, he has received numerous awards, uh, with the topmost being the Sifton Mercator Foundation Senior Fellowship in 2018, which is a, a merit-based fellowship and only six people uh, in the world are chosen uh, every year for this uh, fellowship. Uh, he has also been awarded by the American Education Research Association with the Excellence in Research Award in 2016 and also as an Emerging Scholar Award in 2015. Plus, he also received the UCEA Jeffrey Bennett Outstanding International Research Award in 2016. So, uh, I am extremely delighted to welcome Professor Brown today uh, and hope and believe that we will have extremely good deliberation uh, with you uh, and uh, uh, our students uh, who are from the Postgraduate Department of Education uh, and our faculty members from the Meyer College of Education. It is a good opportunity for them uh, to learn and understand how uh, research and how you know new developments are taking place in other universities and it is also a good opportunity for all of us to collaborate so not taking much time i'll request chris to take over uh, share his screen and uh, we can start with the presentation uh, thank you all once again thank you very much right just uh, trying to find uh, my presentation to share no that hasn't come up can you see this now, this presentation? Uh, it's a blank screen at the moment. Okay, hold on. Sorry, this is, <laughs> this is always, the, uh, always the way, isn't it? Yeah. Right, hold on. Right, let me try again. Oh, there we go. Right, I've got it now. Okay, so you should have that in front of you. That's okay. Brilliant, okay, thank you. So thank you for that fantastic uh, introduction and it's a real honor for me to be here it's quite funny because kind of going to India has always been my kind of list of uh, uh, you know my bucket list as they say things I've always wanted to do so you know at least I'm partially living my dream today uh, by coming to you virtually you know maybe one day we'll, we'll make it a reality um, so the talk um, that, I, that I kind of said perhaps might be useful for you is it's just one to think about as teachers as educators how do we develop new ideas and how do we uh, share those ideas with colleagues so that we're always trying to improve um, how we teach and the outcomes for uh, children that result. Now, just um, we've only kind of given an uh, introduction uh, to, to me, but I just wanted to say a few things to set this into context because I've been interested in this idea of um, you know how we improve teaching and learning for you know kind of 10 years now 
And I started off, um, I was working in policy making, and I was interested in why, um, you know, certain government policies are informed or not informed by evidence. And that started to become a topic of interest for me and ended up becoming the basis of my PhD. And so I was kind of interested, in, okay, what do we do? How do we help policymakers engage with evidence? How do we help policymakers take on board evidence? But um, as, as, as uh, Adit said already, we, you know, I then moved into academia proper. Uh, and my mentor at the time, uh, Professor Louise Stoll said, you know, don't worry about policy. You'll never get policymakers to use research evidence. It just simply doesn't happen. And what you need to do is to focus on teachers. And so I started to turn my attention to how to work with teachers to get teachers to engage with research evidence and to use research evidence to improve what they do. Uh, and I started to kind of under, undertake a number of projects in that area. But then increasingly, you know, I, I thought, okay, well, working with one or two teachers is fine or helping one or two teachers to use research evidence is fine. But how do we do that at scale? How do we ensure that teachers uh, across the piece, you know, within a given district or within a given kind of county or country or area are using research so that everybody benefits, so that it's not just one or two teachers, so that the new knowledge that we get emerging from kind of research informed practice can be beneficial for, for many, many people. So that then led to my kind of um, work on uh, networks and how we can use networks to uh, improve or to help scale up knowledge uh, in and around systems. So in this presentation, what I wanted to do is touch on three things. Uh, I first want to think about this idea of research and form. Can you hear me? Just checking you can hear me still. Okay, cool. So just just wanted to do three things with this presentation. So first of all, to look at uh, the idea of research informed practice, what it is, why does it matter? Um, why do we want to engage in this way of working? And then I wanted to give a wider context about the role yeah. of networks and school systems where the kind of ideal is that the, the participants within not, not, the yeah, yeah. are kind of helping to develop yeah. their own strategies and, and to move them forward. Huh? Uh, and then I wanted to look at how we achieve um, evidence-informed practice, uh, practice at scale using, using networks. So to start with the first of those aims, this idea of research informed teaching practice is that we are encouraging or wishing to get teachers to access research, to evaluate it, to assess its quality, and to start to apply it uh, in order to improve their practice. So it's this idea that actually there's a lot of understanding in academia about how we can do things better, and there's also a lot of understanding clearly in schools and with teachers as to how we can do things better. And therefore, what would be really useful is if we can join those two things together so that teachers can say, okay, well, I know this, but there are gaps in my knowledge. How can this academic research help me uh, to improve what I do? Um, now, there's a, a lot of reasons why we'd want to encourage research informed teaching practice. The first uh, is that actually there is evidence to show that this makes a real difference. There's evidence to show that if we help teachers engage with research evidence, that it can improve their practice, that it can improve children's outcomes. So, for example, we've got Joe Rose and colleagues who used a randomized control trial, and uh, that work showed that actually increased levels of uh, collaborative research used by teachers at a primary level um, not only had a positive impact on their outcomes but also had a positive impact on the outcomes of their students. Um, so we know it improves practice, we know it improves student outcomes. We also know uh, that um, when you start to uh, help schools engage with research use that they change from being um, kind of sites where teachers are maybe exchanging tips or very kind of superficial surface level 
advice on how to improve things uh, to ones in which there is a more strategic focus on what appears to be effective for whom and in what circumstances. And, and there's a kind of culture shift uh, in which there are continuous improvements in knowledge, uh, teacher confidence, improved sharing um, of, of ideas, but in a way that goes beyond the kind of surface level, in a way that's very deep and meaningful and involves really uh, useful collaboration. So we know that it works, you know, for, for want of a better term. But there's also a, a kind of social or moral uh, imperative to engage in this way of working because, um, you know, if it is possible to, or for teachers to um, use research to inform their practice, then they should be doing it. Um, we have people like Anne Oakley who are suggesting that actually what we should always be aiming for as public figures, as people that are involved in uh, you know, practice, is that we should be, when we're intervening in people's lives, when we're teaching or whether we're engaging in medicine or social care or healthcare, that we're doing so with the utmost benefit and the least harm. Um, and in, in that way, you know, it's, it's, it's that the kind of bare minimum of what we, we should expect. If we go to see a doctor, a, me, a health doctor, we would expect to be treated with the most up-to-date uh, medicine. So if we go and see, you know, when we're sending our kids to schools, we should expect teachers to be uh, engaged with, with the kind of most up-to-date pedagogy. Uh, in England, uh, the Charter College of Teaching, which is a relatively new professional body, have suggested that actually teachers engaging with research should be seen as the hallmark of an effective profession. It's a, it's a, you know, a kind of minimum standard we should expect from uh, our teachers. And uh, Dominic Wise and Carol Torgerson, um, Dominic's based at University College London and Carol is at um, Durham, where I am, suggest that there's a, a societal expectation now that actually we want, you know, we're paying tax money, we want student learning to be enhanced through the use of effective research informed teaching. Um, and this um, kind of notion of research informed teaching practice is taking place within a, a kind of wider context that's happening, you know, across many, many school systems. And this is the idea of, of, of school self-improvement, where you have um, specific schools um, who are working as communities of practice, uh, you know, trying to um, kind of teach and encourage teach effective teaching and learning. But at the same time, there is an expectation that rather than have top-down strategies for everything, that schools should be fine with their own effective ways of working. And often what happens here is that you then have um, networks that set up, learning networks, where one or two individuals, in this case, if you look at the dotted diagrams, uh, the stars within those dotted diagrams are kind of network members and they leave the school they join a wider network to learn about new approaches to, you know, uh, could be teaching maths, could be um, English uh, as a second language, it could be many other subjects. And they, they work with colleagues from different communities of practice to learn about these ideas. And they go back into their own schools and they share these new ideas. So you have a kind of constant uh, kind of process of people leaving the school, learning with colleagues, learning with a wider network, which means you tap into more uh, and interesting information then coming back into their school in order to share what's, what's learned. So basically it's a very efficient, effective way of working because rather than everybody collaborating with everybody else, you have one or two people collaborating on behalf of the community of practice uh, and then are able to go back in and support that community of practice. Um, so what I want to talk about with this presentation is just to look at a case study of, of one of these types of works in action to, um, to look at what's called a research learning network to see how this has actually been effective in sharing knowledge. So how it's been effective in moving the knowledge from uh, that center network and, and into those dotted diagrams. Uh, and what clues we can have as to how that, that might work. So um, the kind of notion of research learning networks are, are network learning communities that focus on engaging with academic research. So this ties back to the idea of research informed teaching practice that I mentioned before. Uh, these have been trialed uh, in England and uh, also in the States and in Sweden. 
Um, and originally the, the kind of first iteration, the first approach was trialed in 55 primary schools as part of a, a randomized control trial. And the kind of key characteristics of the approach are that, um, that they rely on a few participants to learn and to develop new research informed practices on behalf of colleagues that they take place in this idea of a cycle of inquiry. So there's four workshops that occur over the course of the year. And in the first workshop, teachers are kind of learning about the problem in question. They're learning about how they understand the context of their school. They're engaging with research. They then take part in the second workshop where they um, kind of look at data about their current situation. They then start to develop new approaches to teaching and learning, and they think about how they're gonna trial those and test those. Then they go and they learn about change management and they test out these new ideas, start to roll them out using leadership and change approaches. And then in the final workshop, uh, they learn about impact evaluation and how um, the, the kind of effects uh, of these new approaches can be learned. So they know whether something has been useful and should be used elsewhere or whether actually they, they kind of develop something, but it hasn't had the desired effect. And in which case, how might they uh, try and change that? for the better. So one of the key things here is that, as I, as I showed you in the, um, the diagram with the, dotted, with the dotted circles, what we've got is a situation where we have individuals that are working in a network, and in this case, it's the research learning network, then they transfer their knowledge and their understanding back to their home schools. But what we want is a situation in which um, they are transferring knowledge back to their home schools so that their colleagues can become experts. And this is really, really important um, because this idea of expertise is kind of crucial to any form of improved teaching and learning. So we can touch on that in a, in a bit more detail. Um, to measure expertise, we used this scale, uh, which, is, um, which was developed by uh, two American academics called Hall and Horde in 2001. And this kind of expertise scale shows how we think uh, that people kind of evolve their engagement with new practices over time. So when you're not an expert, um, you don't have any understanding or any knowledge of something. So you, it's, it's a kind of non-use situation. But you, you begin to develop expertise by preparing uh, for things, by engaging with things, then starting to uh, you know, get information and acquire information, then to start to think about testing things out and how you test things out and whether you start to tailor those things to meet your, your particular situation. Now, a good way to think of expertise is um, you know, but the Dreyfus model. I'm not sure if you've come across the Dreyfus model, but with the Dreyfus model, uh, Dre Dreyfus and Dreyfus suggest that any form of expertise starts by you learning context independent rules for instruction. So for example, if you learn to play chess or if you learn to um, drive a car, you can learn these things by reading a book before you even, you know, start to learn these things by reading a book before you even sit in a car or sit in front of a chessboard. With a car, you know, you can learn about how the biting point of gears, you can learn about the speed limits, you can learn about the, the need to kind of check your mirror and to signal and how you signal and breaking distances and so on. Likewise with chess, you learn what the pieces do, what the aim of the game is, how you move those pieces to achieve uh, the specific um, you know, you know, aims that you're, you're going for and so on. But that isn't going to develop your expertise. It's only when you start to put those things into practice that you start to develop as an expert. So if you think about driving, it's only when you start to try out different types of roads, you know, really busy, crazy streets with people kind of whizzing in and out, you know, big kind of motorways or freeways, where you're driving at high speeds. In England, we have a lot of single lane tracks, um, you know, that uh, often require you to kind of work out whether someone's going to be coming towards you or not. And if so, how do you kind of let them go past? And then in different kind of weather conditions as well. So, uh, you know, whether it's raining, whether there's a kind of mud on the road, whether there's ice on the road, it's only when you start to put in place these kind of context independent uh, things, um, into action that you start to develop a more kind of intuitive understanding of, of when to apply rules, when not, how to tailor uh, what you're doing and so on. 
And so with this expertise scale here, what we want really is for people to, um, you know, start to engage with the practices in question. Uh, first of all, to learn about them, then to start to put them in place, but then to see how they can be uh, tailored or combined with what teachers already do or improved kind of iteratively moving forward. So ideally, um, once these new practices have been brought from the school back into, sorry, brought, brought from the network back into the school, ultimately we want the teachers within the school to be engaging with them as experts. And that, that's kind of key to this whole process. So what we did to develop this specific case study is, um, sorry, to investigate this research learning network is to do a case study. Uh, and we did a mixture of surveys. It was, it was three schools uh, in total. We, we looked at um, a survey of the staff in the schools. They were quite small schools, so we managed to get a, a response rate of 88%. We did interviews with school leaders and participants, uh, and we uh, looked at how um, participants were engaging uh, you know, with these new approaches, how they were being supported by uh, leaders and the school culture. And then we did something called social network analysis as well to actually look at who was connected to whom within schools. And actually we got a really uh, useful set of information from that a kind of social network uh, analysis, which I'm gonna show you yeah. shortly. So what we've got here is uh, a social network diagram. So with a social network analysis, what you do uh, is you ask people within the school, uh, who do you talk to for advice and support? Who do you reach out to? Who do you share information with? Who do you trust? Who do you engage with, basically? Uh, and you give them the list of everybody else in the school and they, and they kind of say, yeah, I talk to this person once a week or this person twice a week or I never talk to this person or I engage with this person about this, but I don't you know, talk to them about work and so on. And with this specific question, what we did was ask teachers about who do you have conversations with about this new practice that's coming in uh, from the network. And what you'll see is so there's three schools represented here. Uh, the top school, school S, um, is in red. Then you've got school C in green and school N in uh, blue. And each one of these uh, kind of dots or squares or triangles um, or diamonds is a teacher or a school leader. So the lines show the kind of interrelations between those, those people. So you can see with the top school, uh, school S, there's actually lots of interconnectivity. Uh, there's lots of, you know, people are coming back from uh, the network and they're talking uh, to each other about these new practices and they're sharing these new practices. But there seems to be less of this going on in school N and there seems to be less of this going on in school C. So that's quite interesting. But what's also interesting is this was just about conversation and nothing else. So the question was, you know, who do you talk to? But it wasn't who do you talk to and then act with or who do you talk to and then uh, engage in professional development with? It was literally sharing information. When we look at a different question, which is who do you um, then engage in professional development and collaboration with, you get a very different picture. So whereas the first school, School S, there was a lot of conversation, when it comes to action, there was, there was much, much less action. Um, you, you've got you know, only two people that are actually engaging in, in kind of further professional development work. So they learn about these new practices, but they don't learn about, uh, they don't then take those further and engage in those further. Whereas in school N, you've got a very different picture. Whereas before, there was not much just conversation. There's a whole load of action going on. People are coming back uh, and they're engaging in continuous professional development. They're engaging in collaborative work, really engaging deeply with these new ideas with one another. And school at C is, is kind of a more of a middling position. There's some conversation, there's some action going on. When we look at the survey results for those schools, what you can see is that clearly school N, um, where there was a, a kind of lot of action going on, you're getting a lot of people reporting expert use of new practices. So when people come back from the network, when they um, engage collaboratively with, collaboratively with their colleagues, when they share new ideas in a way that kind of goes just it goes beyond talk, 
you then get people using those practices as experts. You get them using practices in a way that helps them uh, think about how those practices can be tailored to their, uh, to their current existing uh, teaching, how those practices can be improved further and, and kind of refined over and over again. In school C, which was the kind of middling school, uh, you get a middling level of expertise. And in school S, where it was more conversation, and very little action going on, you don't get people using those practices in the same way. They tend to be preparing for use or they tend to be putting those practices in as a, in a kind of, you know, a, a kind of regimented way in the sense that they're following instructions, but they're not doing more than following instructions. And so we know that actually the, the, the types of use that are going to have the biggest impact on students are the expert uses. So actually with these three schools, the ones that are going to have the best outcomes for students school N and then school C. So what can we learn from this? Well, from these tables and from the, uh, these charts, we can see that something is driving within school N and to an external extent in school C, something that's collaborative, some kind of interactive approach. And as a result of that approach, what we can see is that staff are going beyond just exchanging information to kind of in-depth uh, collaborative activity that's helping them develop as expert users. And as a result, you know, this is going to be improving outcomes for children. So what's important then is the kind of clues that we have for why this is happening and how we can learn from them uh, moving forward. Um, the first thing we wanted to look at was uh, distributed leadership. Now, um, the idea of distributed leadership, a number of different people have written on distributed leadership. Jim Spillane, for example, talks about this idea of um, collective responsibility, collective intelligence, collective sense making. Uh, and so what happens is you have a lot of interaction going on in the school. Uh, and as a result, you're, um, you, you have lots of influence happening uh, that helps people make decisions more, more effectively. And in a way that, you know, while we can understand what Jim's plan means by this, um, sometimes it's a bit of a nebulous definition. And I prefer often this kind of definition by Hare and Go, who talk about these three characteristics of um, distributed leadership, which are about empowerment, they're about interaction, and they're about building capacity. So empowerment basically means that the kind of official school leader, the head teacher or the principal, uh, has basically identified certain people and said, I am giving you the power to make certain decisions or to engage in certain actions um, to be able to make change happen. You have that, you don't have to keep coming back to me, you're allowed to make these decisions. Now, the best way for any change to happen is through interaction because you are then starting a process of influence. Now that process of influence could be two ways because you are trying to convince people to do things, you're trying to affect change. But by through that kind of inter interrelationship, they're also helping you refine your decision making so that it's 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 kind of palatable to a wider audience. So that you are you are saying, okay, this is how we need to do this. This is my suggestion. The other person said, well that might not work. How about we do it like this? And so you're kind of negotiating a, a kind of final outcome that gets you to where you want to be. Now, clearly, you have uh, certain goals as a leader and you want to try and embed those goals. So you also need the capacity to, to affect change because, you know, whilst you, you are happy to accept uh, forms of influence from others, you know, sometimes you have decisions that you have to put in place. So you have to have the capacity to be a change leader and, and to, to use those things. So basically, we wanted, uh, wanted to look at uh, the extent to which teachers were empowered, the extent to which there was interaction, the extent to which they had the capacity to, to make change happen. So is distributed leadership uh, kind of one of the things that is causing uh, this kind of situation of action to, to happen within the schools? So um, distributed leadership is important for this type of way of working because of what uh, Cotter calls the dual system. So in the dual system, um, you have an interplay between uh, kind of hierarchies and networks. And what Cotter says is that actually in the most effective, if most efficient systems, um, you have uh, a kind of seamless meshing between network and hierarchy. So the people that go off and join the network, uh, 
uh, are able to come back in and they'll be able to spread their practice um, most effectively. So ideally what you want then in schools is uh, for network participants to be afford, afforded the autonomy and the freedom associated with student leadership so they can innovate and they can scale up those, those innovations. So going back to Hiren and Go's uh, notion of empowerment, um, interaction and capacity, what they should be empowered to do, what they should have the capacity to do and what the interaction should be about is how these new ideas get to be used by teachers within their schools. Now, what was really interesting is when we started to look at the interview data for uh, these schools, we found that three approaches to distributed leadership kind of materialized. These, these we call DL1, DL2 and DL2+. And in DL1, which was um, school S, um, what happened was, this is the one where there was lots of conversation, but very little action. And what happened was that participants from the, in the network were responsible for developing new approaches to teaching and learning. And then they just encourage other people to take them board. So they'd stand up in team meetings and they say, these are the new approaches we've learned about. You should use them. They're really good. And that was it. That's where it kind of ended. Within uh, school N, what we found is that all teachers have the, have the power to make specific decisions in relation to teaching and learning. But the teachers that were in the network were facilitating a process of, of, of making those decisions. So they were kind of leading that process. Everybody, you know, had the power, but, but the, the, um, the teachers within school N were um, kind of driving that process along. So uh, they were kind of helping everybody come up with collective decisions. And what they were using then is a professional uh, learning community approach with a learning conversation in, in, in them. And I'm going to talk about those in a bit more detail and why they're important. Um, we also found that in School N, uh, they focused on one specific issue. So it might have been feedback, it might have been helping improve the outcomes of, of kids born in the summer term, and so therefore, you know, much younger than the others and so on. But there was one issue. And that's important because in School C, there was a very similar approach, but um, the, each teacher had their own focus. And so the teachers would come back from the research learning network and they said, oh, we've learned about this great new way of connecting research to practice. Everybody should have their own little research project and they should take that forward. Uh, and so there was lots of different themes going on. And sometimes those themes were slightly collaborative and sometimes people were working on those themes by themselves. So what we found that seemed to be really, really important was the use of professional learning communities within certain schools. So um, just to kind of outline what these are in a bit more detail, um, professional learning communities have the kind of following five characteristics in, in place. They have a shared vision and a sense of purpose. Uh, that the kind of members of the professional learning community, uh, they take collective responsibility for student learning. So it's not just about the learning in my student, in my classroom, it's about the learning across the school. Um, but everybody has something to learn from this process. Um, and that people collaborate in ways that go beyond um, just a kind of superficial telling of new ideas, but they actually collaborate in things such as lesson study, where you develop materials together, where one person puts in place the materials, other people watch, and they work out what was effective, what wasn't, and they go around this kind of cycle of, of inquiry. Um, What's really important within the professional learning community is that you have a culture of trust and inquiry. Uh, if you're seeking out help, you've got to be convinced that you're not going to be told that by not understanding already or not knowing already, you know, you're, you're useless as a teacher. But also, if you're going to offer someone help, that, that help is going to be accepted and not dismissed. Uh, and you've got to welcome diverse perspectives, because actually, if we don't look out for new ideas in different ways, then we'll just kind of keep going around on the same old treadmill over and over again. So we know that professional learning communities can be effective. We know that actually when they're done well, uh, professional learning in professional learning communities can lead to improvements in teacher practice and student outcomes. But the question is why that, that's the case. Now, this model um, comes from two Japanese business economists, Nanaka and Takuchi, who in the um, kind of late 80s we're trying to work out why the Japanese economy was outperforming all other economies. Um, 
And they realized that a number of different Japanese companies were kind of going through this cycle of inquiry approach uh, where they would start off uh, by having um, conversations about what we already know. So if we talk about uh, effective feedback, for example, what do we know about effective feedback already? You know, in, in a given staff room in a school, you have you know, hundreds of years worth of experience. So let's tap into that. What makes great feedback? Uh, why is that the case? And that's also important so that we also kind of challenge our, our pre-existing assumptions about what feedback is or, or, or why it matters. So we kind of get that knowledge on the table and we make our kind of tacit knowledge explicit. Then we can introduce research knowledge and we can uh, start to look at um, what other knowledge exists in relation to, say, feedback and learning. And um, how does that augment what we already know? How does it challenge our existing knowledge? How does it deepen our existing knowledge? And then from that, we can start to develop new approaches to teaching and learning. And then we can start to trial those approaches to teaching and learning. And those approaches then become internalized because uh, we are starting to engage with them uh, within our class or within different classes or within different subject areas. And we're starting to see when they're effective and when they're not effective, when they can be tailored. And it's this kind of process of internalization that leads to the expertise we talked about before. It becomes a way of life. You, you develop this kind of holistic, intuitive understanding for why things are. So basically what we know is that this kind of, this notion of learning conversations that take place within professional learning communities leads to the expertise that we've been trying to achieve, to, that we've been trying to foster. So basically within um, uh, School N, uh, what they were doing was delivering this expertise by the distributed leadership of those network participants, facilitating professional learning communities, facilitating kind of learning conversations going on. So, what this kind of data seemed to indicate was that models of distributed leadership where uh, staff are actively involved in decisions about what to adopt, how to adopt them, uh, seem to be more successful in getting staff to actually engage in innovation, really test out how new practices can be used to improve teaching and learning and to continue and to refine practices in an ongoing way. So, you know, they need to this development of expertise. That doesn't necessarily mean the other approaches to distributed leadership were flawed. Um, and in fact, um, you know, they, they could well work if that's what the school leader wanted to do. But it was clear from the interview data uh, that a couple of things needed to happen. So first of all, um, there had to be effective interaction within the school. And some of the interview data kept coming out suggested that this wasn't happening. So we had one quote from a teacher that was saying, well, actually, I feel isolated. Um, I'm a permanent member of staff, but everybody else I work with is, is doing a job share role. So I, I work with different colleagues at the start of the week to the end of the week. And I never get the time to engage with those teachers. Uh, they, this person says, there's never been a point where we've all sat down as a member of staff with our teaching assistants and really talked about what's going on. So if that interaction doesn't happen, you're not going to be able to influence people and you're not going to be able to get them on board in terms of what you want to do and why they should do it. Um, but distributed leaders also need the ability to lead. And for um, the first kind of model of, of distributed leadership, this involves them being able to champion ideas, illustrate why they're important and then relative benefits and persuade others to do them. And so the teachers that have been charged with that need to have the confidence to do that, the presence to do that, an understanding of effective change management. Um, and if those things aren't in place, even if you've got interaction, people still aren't going to take them, take them on board. So what this means is if you're going to kind of adopt a distributed leadership model as a school leader, you need uh, to select your distributed leaders wisely. You need to support them uh, to interact, but you also need them to have the skills or to help them develop the skills that they can become champions of particular ideas. So if, if people want to have that kind of advocate approach, they need that. Now clearly if people want to have the kind of model where these professional learning communities, the people that are participating need to know how to facilitate those, those effectively as well. So there's always a kind of question of what's the role entail and how can 
uh, that role be supported as effectively as possible. What we also looked at was the role of trust within the schools and the role of innovation culture in the schools. And we know that in high trust schools, that individuals are supported to uh, engage in risk taking um, and innovative behavior because it's, it's, it's accepted that it's okay to take risks, it's okay to do things. And if they go wrong, as long as you learn from those things, uh, that's absolutely fine. And as long as those kind of risks aren't, you know, without justification. So we would expect a, a kind of culture that encourage risk taking to be more likely to uh, result in, in teachers engaging in evidence informed practices. Likewise, uh, we know that research informed practices is more likely to materialize when school cultures are attuned to innovation. So for example, when school leaders are promoting uh, the benefits of considering innovative out of the box ideas, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the idea that we should be experimenting, working with new ways of working and so on. But what was really interesting was that when we looked at the role of trust within these three schools, actually the, there was trust across the piece. You know, all of the schools had high levels of trust and school S, which was the one that had that performed the least well um, in terms of kind of mobilizing those ideas, had the highest levels of trust. Likewise, when we looked at innovation, you know, all of the schools had quite a high level of kind of innovation and uh, ability to experiment. And so what this kind of led us to think was that actually cultures of trust and innovation are what we call hygiene factors. So if you go to a restaurant and you have a clean knife and fork, you don't think anything of it. If you don't have a clean knife and fork, you'll, you'll complain about it. So there's a kind of base level of service that you would expect from going in a restaurant. And we kind of think the same thing might apply to schools. There's a kind of base level of trust and innovation that you'd expect. But beyond that, more trust and more culture of innovation doesn't mean you'll be, be even more likely to engage in research informed practice. You just need a kind of basic minimum standard of, of finding things out. We also developed a, a few other clues, and I'll start to wrap up now so that you, you know, give you time to answer questions. But one of the important things was this role of social influence. Now, I think this is, this is quite interesting. So if you imagine um, for a moment, uh, you're in a restaurant with eight of your friends. You've had a lovely meal, and it's time for the final course. It's time for dessert. And you really want dessert. And you are, you know, you've been waiting for some ice cream or coffee or whatever it might be for a while, and you really want it. Uh, anyway, the waiter comes round and asks all of your friends, "Do you want dessert?" And your friend says no. And the next friend says no. And the next friend says no. And all of your friends say no. They don't want dessert. And then the waiter comes and asks you and says, "Do you want dessert?" And by that point, you're probably thinking, "Well, I did," but everybody else has said no, so I'm probably going to say no. So, kind of social influence works to change your decisions in this way. Likewise, you have to imagine um, this is the kind of it's supposed to be an empty car park. I couldn't find a, a better picture, so I use this. But you've got an empty kind of field, and uh, you're going to a music festival, and you're, you're invited to kind of uh, park your car in this field. So you go uh, and park your car in a field in a particular direction. You can be guaranteed the next car that comes in will come and park next to you in the same direction. So your decision has already affected someone else's choice because they could park anywhere, it's an empty field, but they'll park next to where you park in the same direction that you park. Likewise, you know, you go away, you go to Brazil or somewhere on holiday, you take all the clothes you put available, but you don't know what the weather's like. You didn't check beforehand and you can't understand the Portuguese television station you're watching. So you look out the window and you see people are wearing, you know, shorts or, you know, short sleeves or whatever else. So you think, oh, okay, well, it must be warm. So I'll wear, I'll wear similar. So again, social influence affects how we make decisions and why we do things as we do. Uh, and influence, which is key to distributed leadership, is a form, uh, is a form of influence. And so leadership is a form of influence. So an influence can happen up and down uh, hierarchical boundaries. It can happen across the university. And actually, we need to pay attention to who the informal leaders are within schools. So um, who are the people that kind of influence others to make specific decisions or to, um, you know, who, who are the ones you need to have on board if you want to introduce a new initiative to your school? 
So again, this relies on kind of social network analysis and looking at who people turn to for advice and support. And really what you need is people like this. You need people at the center of, of, of webs of influence, because if you want to kind of roll out new practices, you need to get the most influential people on board. So as, as leaders, when we're choosing our distributed leaders, we need to make sure we pay attention to the, the, the role, of, role of influence. Uh, and that means kind of selecting opinion forms. And um, again, if you use net social network analysis, it's who are people, uh, who, who are those people that are often turned to by their colleagues for trusted work-related advice and support? And, and how might you identify those? And then lastly, just thinking about the other roles that school leaders need to play when uh, we are kind of thinking about how to make research informed practices a reality and how to get the most from kind of networks into the school. And there's, some, there's two things that really kind of emerge here. The first is this idea of formalizing. So making new practices part of what's done around here, making sure that the policies within the school, such as the school improvement plan, the performance management plan, uh, making sure that school governors are involved, all reflect the importance of engaging with networks, taking new ideas, bringing them back into the school and using them. Um, the school leaders also need to prioritise, so they need to make sure that they're allocating resources and organising structures to help new practices be engaged with. Um, so, you know, is there the time, is there the place, are teachers being freed up from their teaching duties to engage with these new, new resources? And there's also this idea of signalling as well, because uh, there's no point um, kind of signalising signaling something as a priority when there are 20 other priorities already, because that simply means that you don't understand what the notion of a priority is. So the last thing I'm just going to highlight is Normally I'd ask this question out loud, but this is a coffee maker, right? But this is also a coffee maker. So what are the differences between these, these kind of coffee makers? Now, if you look at the work of you know, Jean Bourgelard, he would say that actually, when we're purchasing anything, what we have to think about is kind of use, exchange, and signification of consumer goods. So when it comes down to kind of helping teachers engage with new practices, you know, we need to signal some of these key attributes to them so that they'll take them on board. So what's the relative advantage of what I'm trying to get you to do? To what extent does this innovation uh, do something better than what we had before? So therefore, why should you take it on board? To what extent does it require you to have new skills? Uh, or, you know, can it be seen as compatible with what we already do? Is it easy to use or is it difficult to use? Do we know that it has benefits and therefore I'm more likely to be incentivized to take it on board? Can I practice it? So really to kind of show those, those things off. So just uh, summarizing then, um, research informed teaching practice is important. We know it makes a big difference to um, teaching practice and to student outcomes. Uh, in networked and school improving systems, we want one or two people to leave their schools to engage with others and to be able to mobilize new teaching and learning practices so that everybody benefits. The most effective way to do that seems to be a distributed leadership model using professional learning communities and learning conversations. But we also need to think about who it is we choose to be those kind of network champions. Uh, because people that senses of webs of influence are more likely to get people to take on board new ideas. We have to have trust in innovation cultures within our schools, but they're kind of hygiene factors. They're not something that keep, need to be kind of ramped up over and over again. And school leaders need to be able to formalize and prioritize uh, new approaches to teaching and learning. But you also need to show off why something's important and why people should be doing that moving forward. So, that's my presentation. Hopefully it's useful for you. Uh, and I'd welcome any thoughts or questions you may have. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Chris, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure uh, all of us uh, would be buzzing with the uh, questions uh, at this moment. And uh, we have received a number of questions through the chat session, which was going on simultaneously when you were presenting. Okay. So I compliment you that, uh, the notion of distributed leadership and um, you know the professional learning networks that you uh, explained to us today 
although we might be practicing in our own little ways uh, in our uh, uh, educational setup, but somehow uh, the two important points that you put at the end was, you know, formalizing and prioritizing. Uh, we probably need to, you know, have uh, the system more formalized so that everybody can really take benefit from the distributed uh, learning networks and the whole idea of distributed leadership and uh, people start taking or you know responsibility and an onus of accountability on themselves to take things further but nonetheless an excellent presentation and we've really learned a lot uh, i have with me uh, my colleague uh, professor mulraj who is the head of the department of the postgraduate uh, department of education uh, and he's been interacting at the back end with students and faculty members and uh, he's received a number of questions so i'll just uh, ask him to uh, start by you know asking one question at a time and some of the questions I have with me I'll take them so I'll just request him to uh, start with the first question what we have we got uh, yes sir uh, good afternoon everyone yeah so uh, the first question was that how can our network be adapted to increase access to innovative learning opportunities in rural areas it's a great question the um, because um, and we, we have similar issues in the UK as well, in the, in the sense that you, you have, you know, really widely spread, um, spread schools uh, and often, you know, you, you have schools that are kind of under, under resourced. Where we found this has worked is the use of technology and that you start to develop um, kind of digital networks uh, and you start to work in the same way working now through Zoom or through other forms of, of kind of digital practice. Uh, and that you set aside kind of times to engage with your your kind of your colleagues. Now, the benefit of that is that you're not restricted then by geography. You're, you are, you can f effectively link up with people up and down, you know, states or countries, uh, all sharing similar, uh, you know, issues. You know, because I think that it's, it's really kind of context um, context important that you know you're connecting with other rural teachers who kind of share similar issues of teaching and learning. So. In a nutshell, the answer is, is trying to um, deploy digital uh, resources and uh, to, to foster that kind of network way of working. Thanks a lot. Okay. So uh, the second question was that what strategies help you to become a reflective teacher and then help in improving a new practice? That's really interesting, uh, actually, because that's one of the kind of the, the under-researched areas in this field, how you develop reflective problem solving ability or reflective professional inquiry. And it's quite a timely question because we have just been doing a literature review in this area to look at, um, you know, what really facilitates reflective professional practice. And um, how you kind of do that is you need to disrupt um, kind of ways of working or ways of, of seeing things. You need to challenge yourself so that you're developing what Kahneman calls kind of type two thinking so um, that you are kind of you know, you know putting in challenges to your assumptions putting in challenges to um, you know your existing kind of frameworks and creating that kind of cognitive dissonance so often what works is 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 slowing things down so it's not immediately getting people to jump straight to decisions but they're thinking about the basis for their decisions and why specific decisions were made so maybe using theories of action that say, well, why do we think things work in this way? And what data have we got to show that might be the case? What data perhaps challenges those ideas? Or when you are actually reading research, very simple techniques like using two different color pen, what are the things you agree with and what are the things you disagree with? Because often what we do when we read through new ideas and research is that we tend to agree with all the stuff that uh, co coheres with our way of thinking, with our kind of frame, mental frameworks. But if we kind of have to actively say, okay, well, these are the things I agree with, these are what I disagree with, you can then start to question, well, why does that challenge? Um, and what if it was, you know, what if it was true? How would that, how would that be? Uh, or when we kind of look at research, start to think, okay, how does this challenge what we know? How does it augment what we know, but how does it challenge what we know? And how are we gonna take on board or address those challenges? Or how might the world be if those challenges were right? So you've gotta develop kind of frameworks within the workshops to um, disrupt people's um, kind of cognitive states. Right. Yeah, that's well, very nice, nicely answered. And the third question was, how can you differentiate between mechanical use and expert use of a practice of a teacher? 
broadly, what, what happens then is you're still with mechanical use, you're still um, kind of going through things as you were taught and not trying out new ways of doing stuff. You know, you, you've been given a set of instructions and you don't want to deviate from that set of instructions because you're worried you're going to do things wrong. But with uh, expert use, you've started to experiment and okay, you might get things wrong, but you've learned from it. But also you're starting to tie in other knowledge that you've got. So you think, okay, well, what about if I take this and I add this? Or what about if I um, kind of, you know, try and put this in a different situation that I haven't been taught? Or what about if I'm, I do something even better? So it's, it's kind of trying to get the, it's trying to improve what you get from it. So it's not just doing something well, but according to instructions, it's trying to improve so that you get even better results. Yeah. Uh, then fourth question was, uh, how can we implement distributed leadership for the development of a school? So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to this kind of definition by, by Herian and Go that you've got to have um, your school leader, first of all, has got to be interested in this way of working and being willing to give away power to a certain extent, because one of the biggest challenges for distributed leadership models is that the school leader can't just snatch the power back they have to say actually i i need to trust you that you can do this and take this forward on my behalf so it's it's kind of having that mentality that you're willing to give up power but then um choosing people that have influence within the school choosing people um that have the capacity to lead or building that capacity to lead so all the things you need to be an effective change leader putting in place um forums so that they can for us so they can interact with each other uh, and kind of supporting them to do that. So it's, it's having that, you know, this person now has the power, this person has the skills to do this, and this person has the interaction, giving them a clear kind of mandate to do that. Right. So uh, a similar question that we got um, um, kind of related to this was, uh, what steps can school leaders, you know, take to support their distributed leaders? Yeah, so it's, it's a very similar, uh, a very similar thing. But on top of that, it's you know, it's it, it's as I said, going 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 back to this kind of idea of formalising. So having it as part of your job description, letting everybody know that this person has responsibility and that they need to listen to this person, uh, and making sure you're investing in your people. You know, often we we kind of have these terms and these ideas, um, but unless we're supporting people to understand what collaboration means and showing what it means. Uh, they're not going to understand. But also, you know, with school leaders, you've got to be able to uh, walk the talk, right? If you're saying you want something to happen, you've got to actually sh model what it is you want to happen so that people can understand this, this new way of learning and they can understand that if you're doing it, then it's okay for them to do it. Right. That's right. In fact, one interesting question that we got probably was from the, uh, the research networks that you have seen, the diagrams that you have shown, uh, was that uh, what kind of a software that you use to get the distributed network diagrams, you know, going on? Yeah, so um, typically you use this uh, software called UCINet, which is free to download. Um, it's UCINet, yeah. And it's it's uh, it was produced by someone called Borgatti. Um, so basically, you have to develop a survey where you've got the names of everybody else in the school. You're asking people who they engage with and what they engage with, okay. and then you're building this kind of matrix of interrelationships right. using this UCI net. You can build charts with that. Okay. So I hope people who had asked this question are actually noting it down because it's going to help us later in uh, research. Uh, another uh, question that came to us was, uh, how can educationists tackle issues of teaching and learning through uh, network leadership and distributed leadership? So I think with, um, I, I think with this, what, what's important is that you've got a kind of common topic that you're trying to explore. So what are the kind of key issues that are facing a group of schools and what do you want to look at? Because I think the strength of doing that is that you can together work out what's causing this issue and why uh, you know what what are the kind of fundamental drivers for it and then if you're working as a network you're kind of drawing on the expertise of other people in that network so it's not just within your school but it's it's kind of beyond your school right. uh, and then you're also kind of drawing on 
uh, the experiences of other people have of trying new approaches to teaching and learning. How does it work for them? Might it work for me? So I think with that, with that networked approach, what you're really getting is you're kind of drawing on the wisdom of others. Uh, and instead of just a few people within your school, you're drive, you know, drawing on five or six other people and all their experiences. So that's why I think it's such a powerful approach for really kind of you know, driving teaching and learning. Yeah. So one uh, of our colleagues has asked that what methods you suggest um, and can be considered to be useful for uh, you know effective distributed leadership and I could probably uh, ask what would be you know the key three or four areas or characteristics of distributed leaders that could help us identify in our system yeah okay so I, I think these people have got to have had uh, a good level of teaching experience mm. um, they've got to understand you know pedagogic concepts they've got to have understood how teaching and learning happens within a given context for some time. So they've got to have the knowledge and the skills in that sense. But they've also got to be people that are, uh, you know, that other people look up to and respect. They've got to be people that are willing to kind of facilitate and coach and support others. Um, and they've got to be people that are, are happy and confident right. to, um, you know, to kind of lead a, lead a process and, and be comfortable in that, in that, in that position right great so there are you know so there are technical skills if you you know they've got to have the the ability and they've got to have the knowledge but they've got to have the kind of softer skills as well to be able to lead change and to be able to reach out and their kind of personal confidence so often if you, if you think about that kind of big five you know often they're the extroverts you know those kind of people right so dr Muldaj, do we have another question uh, uh yes yeah, sir it, it is uh, somewhat related to covid 19 situation uh-huh that uh, how can a teacher create a learning environment in the pre prevailing situation uh, in order to motivate students from learning and staying at home mm. yeah well, that's i mean that's really interesting I, I i think i mean for me um it's it's you know providing how do you provide interaction in this kind of environment how do you provide really exciting resources so that kids are kind of motivated and self-regulated to want to want to engage so it's 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 kind of about the resource and can you use again technology to connect people to get them to working on joint projects you know are there kind of uh, uh, project related tasks that can stretch beyond you know individual days that involve you collaborating with your peers that involve you going to seek other knowledge and to bring back and to solve solve problems so again it's it's how do you harness technology in that way and how do you how do you deliver something that kids are going to be engaged with <laughs> across the time right great uh, so i think we have already uh, touched all the questions great so now now sir you can take over yeah yeah so then um, uh, chris i would really like to thank you for sparing your valuable time and being with us today uh, through the medium and i'm sure our uh, students and teachers uh, would have got a good idea as to what the distributed networks are and how the professional learning networks can really help teachers and educators to go ahead in life, especially in their own professional development. And I'm sure uh, we'll continue to uh, connect with you, take your help, uh, develop such systems here in our institution. And uh, we really thank you, uh, you know, for uh, helping us uh, with this connect today. Um, I once again thank all my faculty members and all the students for uh, connecting with us on this platform and making this a successful one. Uh, and I hope that in future we'll have more interactions together. Thank you so much, Chris, for connecting. It was an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.